Hello and welcome everyone to the Liza West YouTube channel with me, your host, Eliza Westgate. And today I am beyond honored and excited to welcome Gil to join me for this exciting and long form version edition of The Rundown. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Gil, but just in case you aren't, he is one of the most talented broadcasters in the tennis world. And alongside his famous YouTube show, Monday Match Analysis, which has taught me so much this year, Gil is also a broadcaster for Tennis Channel, US Open Radio, Cracked Rackets, and UC San Diego. So welcome, Gil, and thank you so much for being the first guest on my YouTube show. <laughs> Great to be here, Eliza. Um, I'm honored by, by the kind words in the intro and honored to be the first guest. Is this video number one, or, or you've been posting the rundown to the YouTube channel? Because <laughs> I know we, we spoke a few months back, and you told me I'm about to start this channel, uh, but, <laughs> but is, is this video number one or video number one oh, let's, go. let's go love it let's get yes. the show on the road let's get it on the road so i'm super excited and um yeah so so for folks who are joining us in today's video we will be discussing and ranking our top 10 most dramatic moments and controversies that took place in the tennis world in 2023 we pre-selected a list of top 10 moments that we'll be discussing today. There was a short list of about 20 moments. Honestly, probably could have been more than that, um, that could have made the top 10. So you can reference that original list in the description below. Let us know if we should have swapped any of those moments out uh, for the ones that we chose in the comments. And the goal really for us is for Gil and I to debate, share our opinions and ultimately leave the door open for all of you to join in on the conversation. So at the end of the video, please drop us a comment and let us know how your rankings would shape up in comparison to ours. So without further ado, here are our nominees for the top 10 most dramatic moments and controversies in 2023. And before we get to ranking them, Gil and I will provide a little bit of a refresher on each of these moments. All right. Uh, WTA finals didn't exactly go off without a hitch this year. In Cancun, uh, the tournament location being different for the third straight year, the weather conditions were horrid. The fan attendance was meh. Uh, the overall last minute nature of the event, the center court not being ready uh, upon the players arriving on site. Also, the court itself seemed to be pretty inconsistent and, and low quality. So uh, the players, the eight were not, well, eight plus the doubles teams, the eight doubles teams were, uh, were not too thrilled and they didn't get a lot of uh i'm sorry from the wta either no location is announced for 2024 so uh it remains to be seen if the wta finals uh, will be able to step up its game for next year so the madrid open was an event uh this year that fell under a lot of criticism the tournament continued to use models as ball girls um so for the male matches we had female models for the female matches we had male models um, and this is a, an age-old tradition of theirs that was supposed to be phased out, but uh, snuck back in this year. We also had the drama of Cake Gate, which seemed to take social media by storm, where Arena Sabalenka's cake was quite small in comparison to the cake that Carlos Alcaraz received on court. And then we finished off the tournament with some more controversy and drama where the women's winning double team, doubles team was not allowed to give a victory speech after the tournament. Uh, the men's doubles teams, however, were given that opportunity. Sure. Um, we had a couple of 18-month bans for the same reason. It, it's uh, Michael Emer and Jensen Brooksby not properly reporting their whereabouts. You get three strikes in a year and if you if you have whereabouts failures three times within one year uh, you face a penalty emer has since said that he's retiring from tennis jensen brooksby has not said as much but he has been very adamant that 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 third strike where he was apparently in the hotel where the doping agent came to test him and they couldn't quite link up in that moment mm. uh brooksby has been has been very adamant that he should not have received a strike 
on that occasion. Another one on our list is the Simona Hallett ban, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Um, just a couple months ago, it was confirmed that she has received a four year ban for testing positive for Ruxodistat. That took place um, at the end of 2022. So the ban will serve unless she is successful with her appeal. Um, and that will likely have further news coming out next year. Roland Garros, Miu Kato, uh, doubles match. She hit a ball girl and unfortunately had to be disqualified, which you never like to see. Uh, unfortunately, Cerebas Tormo and Marie Bojkova seemed very pleased uh, about yeah. seeing it and even advocated for the disqualification of Miyu Kato, who lost all of her prize money, which was about $45,000 as a result of the disqualification. And uh, many players on tour ended up defending Kato and many fans got on the case of both Marie Bojkova and Sarah Cerebas Torma. Then we had Hugo Gaston, who just seemed to be on an unsportsmanlike tear this year. He received four code violations for inappropriate unsportsmanlike behavior on the court. Perhaps the one that was the most resulted in the most eye-watering fine uh, was a match versus Chorich, where he just decided to take a ball out of his pocket in the middle of a point in an attempt to force a replay. Uh, this was on set point. And uh, the umpire called him out for it. And uh, obviously he, he lost the point and then received a big fine. The fine actually amounted to more than what he had earned at that point in this year. Um, and he has since uh, been accused of throwing a match, uh, retiring on match point. So he's got some not so friendly rumors or truths following behind him this year. <laughs> Match yeah. fixing scandal. Uh, Washington Post had this two part uh, investigative piece that outlined the intricate betting ring run by uh, Griogur Sargesian. Uh, he built the biggest match fixing ring in tennis history, made over $9 million in just two years. Over 180 players were involved from over 30 different countries. Uh, the, the TIU was able to eventually snuff it out. Uh, he was arrested. His nickname was the maestro. Uh, so we've always kind of su uh, suspected that tennis, especially at the lower levels, was vulnerable to this kind of thing. And lo and behold, a very large organized betting ring was exposed this year. As many of you know, the, the ball complaints have been ever growing this year. I felt like it was it started from the jump at the Australian Open with Nadal pointing out that the quality of the balls felt different from previous years. And throughout the year, the story has kind of continued with players of, of all levels, um, suggesting that the constant changing of the balls from tournament to tournament week after week is resulting in injuries that could have possibly been prevented. So kind of conversation around, you know, what should tennis's governing bodies be doing to make sure that they're looking after the health and well-being of the players while also giving tournaments the freedom to kind of have their own partnerships and rights with manufacturers. Yeah, tough issue, but it was frustrating to hear this all year because yeah. you want the players to be happy with the balls that are being played with. Uh, night one at the U.S. Open always or very <laughs> often brings a little bit of fun or controversy. And uh, Laura Sigmund was at the center of attention for her first round match versus Coco Goff when she was uh, – she was given a warning by the umpire for wasting time, and the U.S. Open crowd at Arthur Ashe Stadium definitely got on her case uh, for doing so with uh, booing, uh, ringing <laughs> loud around the stadium. Coco, at one point, complaining about Sigmund's pace of play, which, of course, urged the crowd to go even harder on the German player, and uh, Sigmund, in her post-match press conference, was left in tears. Uh, based yeah. on how the U.S. Open crowd treated her against the American favorite Coco Golf. <laughs> the U.S. Open crowds can be absolutely brutal. Uh, same thing, same thing with Ben. Uh, he definitely excited them with this put down, hang up the phone celebration that he used uh, getting into the semifinal after he beat Tiafo. Uh, in some of his press conferences in the lead up to Djokovic, the, his semifinal match with Djokovic, 
it, I guess it came across that maybe Ben, you know, had no fear against Djokovic, and some some folks might have interpreted that as as a kind of level of arrogance that they didn't appreciate. And perhaps Djokovic was one of those in the didn't appreciate camp and blatantly copied the hang up the phone celebration <laughs> towards the end. Uh, and my favorite part to all this was kind of Ben's reaction in the press conference of, oh, you know, copying is the sincerest form of flattery, which I thought was uh, an excellent comeback from his part. <laughs> yeah, this this definitely got people talking. Um <laughs> And the story was extended because Ben's dad had some comments a, a week <laughs> yes. later as well. So this will be a fun one to go over. Yeah, yeah. So without further ado, what we'll be doing is just kind of dragging and dropping these cards into our top 10 kind of ranked list. We'll go through and kind of debate each of these and try to come to a consensus between the two of us. And yeah, so, so we'll kind of kick things off. Is there... One on this list where you're feeling strongly about that you would you would kind of head towards the top three. <laughs> yes, uh, I think the WTA finals is the one that sticks out to me more than anything. Yes, just because of, of how many layers there were to it and because of how long it lasted. Like, Eliza, this started right with people posting pictures of the stadium that was undone. Right. <laughs> and everybody was like, wow. This is what this is what the stadium looks like right now, a month before the event. And it was yeah. at that point where I was a little bit like, OK, it's kind of funny, but sympathetic and just like, OK, they're building a, a court. Let's give them a break. It's OK. <laughs> then they get there. It's still not done. That was like, all right, it's a little much, but we'll still give them the benefit of the doubt. Then the players get on the court and they're like, this court is terrible to move on. And sometimes the ball bounces 10 feet in the air and sometimes it doesn't get above my knees. So yeah. what the heck is that? And that is before <laughs> the hurricane wind kicked in and it became completely impossible to play uh, decent tennis. Plus, you had a lot of political backdrop going on with with players kind of airing their their large picture grievances and with <laughs> everybody kind of together in one place with the WTA brass also there, it was a chance yeah. to kind of go over those things. So it was a big kind of, uh, it felt like a angsty kind of muck up of, of controversies at an event that is literally supposed to celebrate the tour at the very highest level. And you were there. Yes, I was there. And I can confirm it, it, it was a total shit show. I mean, the, the court itself, was built on top of what looked like maybe a three inch board of plywood and surfacing on top of that. I spoke to some photographers who said that it was one of the most dangerous stadiums that they had worked in. They saw that parts of the stadium was screwed into tree roots. I mean, it was built on top of a wet, soaking wet golf court, uh, golf course with a lot of sand. Um, the fan experience just kind of accessing the stadium was totally not accessible you know and with the rains and the wind you're trudging through a lot of mud just to just to get to the court and you know ultimately at the end of the day it just really wasn't very well attended which you know for an end of season tournament that's most to, meant to celebrate your top eight most talented players of the year uh, it just did not reflect the success that they had had and was not a tournament that felt like a celebration it felt more like an afterthought and to be honest with you I totally understood and kind of was on the side of the players um around their complaints and I think you know what's a real shame to me coming out of all of this is that the WTA still hasn't given a transparent and clear answer as to why they even ended up in Cancun you know the original plan they had said in May was back to China then there were rumors that they were working on something to go to Rihad then maybe the the news or gossip around that broke which started to make players and sponsors feel uncomfortable so the wta is you know looking around trying to see where they could get an alternative bid from and it just seems like cancun during kind of towards the end of hurricane season like such a strange decision to make and in my opinion i just kind of felt like you know this is the this is the type of opportunity where you would want your leader your ceo to do a press conference 
to hold their hands up and be super transparent be like, look, this is what happened. This, these were the decisions that were made and this is why we're here and we're sorry. And, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to not be in this position next year. And even now, you know, they've released the calendar for 2024 and we still don't have an answer on where it's going to be. So I, I feel like it's not just the finals itself, but it's all of the governance around it that that makes it feel like the fans and the players don't deserve to have an answer, which is just not right, in my opinion. Yeah, the big mess. I mean, from John Wertheim's reporting, it, it sounded like they were really kind of set on going to Saudi Arabia and then had mm. to scramble when that kind of <laughs> fell apart in their eyes. But if you went to a place like Ostrava, Czech Republic, it, you have a large city with locals that like tennis. Yes. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna get an event that that would have panned out a lot better than Cancun. Oh, and you have a stadium that's already kind of built and ready to go. So yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions. And yeah, I mean, the good thing about this, you know, so it's not all negative, 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 is you know there is an expectation from the fans and the players that it's going to be a lot better. It needs to be a lot better than that. So you know, it, at least there wasn't any complacency. Uh, there was accountability about the clear fact that the WTA finals needs to be at a higher level uh, in multiple aspects than what it was in, in Cancun. And for me, that was the biggest controversy and drama of the season, just because of how, um, how much of a faux pas it ended up being in such an important event. I agree. So do we want to, Put that in the number one spot for now and kind of see where we go to. Sure. All right. Let's move it on over. Anything in this list sticking out to you as like, yeah, this isn't bothering me all that much. You would put it towards the end of your list. Probably the Gaston fines. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you, what do you think of that choice? I, you know, I just, I guess it's like, I guess it, it doesn't really uh, register on my radar all that much that, mm -hmm. you know, one individual is just not too interested <laughs> in putting effort on the court and is kind yeah. of just misbehaving within his matches in various ways. Uh, I guess we've seen it before at, at different kind of levels. You know, there was a period of time where, you know, Nick Kyrgios couldn't really go three matches without taking mm. a fine. Uh, Benoit Pair. <laughs> went through a, a phase very similar to that. And it, it usually mm -hmm. means players are just completely, again, I'm, I'm generalizing here. It usually means players are just kind of miserable, not enjoying themselves <laughs> whatsoever, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, for, for Gaston, especially, it, it isn't even to the level of, of Kyrgios, who had shown or continues and, and always shows a level of potential to actually be a top player. Uh, mm -hmm. For Hugo Gaston, I, I think if he focuses actually and, you know, maximizes his career at any point, I think he can be a consistent top 100 finisher. But mm -hmm. it, it's not so much a, a case of how, how is Hugo Gaston wasting this? You know, uh, it, it, it's he's throwing away an opportunity to be a top 10 player. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. even get that feeling with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I followed the clips of Gaston kind of acting a fool <laughs> throughout the year, but. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's like, all right, uh, he's doing that over there. And um, I don't think we need to spend too much energy worrying about it. Okay. So you don't think there might be something darker at play? Like sometimes I look at it and I look at like the match fixing scandal story and some questions come to mind in terms of like, why are you, you know, doing these types of things on set points, on match points, like, you know, reading that match fixing scandal story it seemed like they were quite intentional about, you know, what games or points they wanted players to throw. But it seems like that story was sort of more around players who are in the challenger level, not quite the top 100. Do you think there's even a possibility that that could be happening for Gaston? Or are you blaming it more on his kind of mentality and, and what you had just kind of spoke about? He'd be doing a really bad job. So <laughs> I think like... It's so it would be so obvious based on the ways he is self sabotaging that if there was any irregular betting activity attached to Gaston, 
it would be seen a mile away. Like, I guess yeah. we, we'll get to the match fixing thing. It's, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing. Um, and yeah. I've studied it across different sports, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, if you're going to do it, you have to be subtle, uh, because they are very good at, at catching you. Mm -hmm. Gaston, Gaston would be caught very, very easily. So yeah, I yeah. just think, I think it's a guy who is unable to control his, his mind and his impulses on court and somebody who uh, is not is not able to maintain a fighting spirit when mm -hmm. anything is going the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. I can align with you on that, seeing that he's kind of an individual and, as you say, someone who's not necessarily fighting for a top 10 position, but rather being a solid top 100 player. I am on board to put him in the 10th spot for now. I want to switch to the bands the Yima and Brooksby bands and the Simona Halep bands um just kind of starting off with Yima and Brooksby as you mentioned Yima has since said that he's retiring as a result of the ban and Brooksby um well actually both of them have been pretty adamant that that third whereabout strike shouldn't have counted for them what are your kind of thoughts on that 18 month ban in general? What would your suggestion be in terms of, you know, how they write out the ban and then maybe moving forward, you know, would you prefer to see a different length of ban be implemented for this type of whereabouts charge? Yeah. I mean, I would say in Brooksby and I know more about the Brooksby case because I think okay. more, more has been reported on that versus mm -hmm. Emer. Um, I mean, look, Jensen, was irresponsible uh there's no yeah. doubt about it like he he because he didn't take responsibility for anything when it came to his whereabouts like he relied on his team to do it and didn't didn't really seem very aware of what the rules were or what was expected of him in this program but where i have stood up for the players always um in in all of these cases is that they simply have no bargaining power to negotiate with with the tours like, hey, uh, we would like this to be loosened or we would like mm -hmm. this to be the penalty. Not to say that players should always get their way when it comes to these kinds of things, but man, they should be at the table uh, like they are in other sports. In, in all yeah. collective bargaining, drug testing is like a major topic of conversation when the leagues and the players associations have to agree uh, to, you know, create these, um, these contracts, these, um, I, I'm, the name is escaping me. Oh, collective bargaining agreements. Um, so I think the players in a lot of ways are very vulnerable and don't get a say at the same time. I don't think it's very difficult to avoid these three whereabouts violations in one year if you're actually yeah. just you know taking the whole program seriously yeah i would agree with that i mean it, it seems like a complicated system and it does i'm sympathetic to the fact that i feel like you know tennis has pretty much no off season so and and the testing also happens in off season so it's something an individual sport that you have to be aware of around the clock and maybe in other individual sports like boxing or, um, you know, uh, competitions like ice skating or things like that, that then they're not always testing with the same level of vigor year round, you know, each and every day you're having to give your whereabouts and your locations. And because you're traveling across the world, you're dealing with different time zones, you might be switching hotels or changing your flights, depending on results. I think it definitely seems like something that could be challenging for younger players who maybe don't have, you know, a, a good relationship kind of set up with their agent or the people around them and don't have a solid system put in place where you could see, you know, in a year, three times, like, oops, I, I missed this thing. Like I could see that happening, but at the same time, it's, it's your career, it's your reputation. Not only might you be banned for 18 months, but you might suffer from, you know, loss of sponsorships or deals and contracts around, you know, your career in itself. And so it is your responsibility to make sure that you're checking the app every every day and updating your whereabouts or that you can rely enough on your agent to know that they're going to do that at all times and not make a mistake. And um, it just seems 
like both of them really have a very good excuse for that third one um which i'm sympathetic to but at the same time they have both admitted that the first two was entirely their fault and it's sort of just like well you know maybe you should have learned the lesson after the first one and not put yourself in a situation where you were risking the third ban and and if you were risking it you better have done everything in your power possible to make sure that you're not getting in the third one yeah both of those players are very consistent on the court so they know how to play with margin when it comes yeah. to uh, a baseline rally they did not play with margin <laughs> when it came to this whereabout system and just for anybody who doesn't know the rule is when you are out of competition uh, which means you're not signed up for a tournament in any given week. You must provide, you must I input in an app uh, where you are going to be for one hour, could be any hour um, during a day. So usually that's like a hotel room. Um, it might be a gym. Uh, you are just reporting your whereabouts for one hour every day when you are not signed into a tournament. Yep. And it seems simple, but... <laughs> for these two clearly it's not uh to me this this ban or this kind of controversy I, I would put that in the you know eight through ten range to me it was definitely something that we had a lot of conversation around i are you taking the yimer retirement seriously or do you think that that's just a a tactic he's using to continue to be able to to practice where he needs to practice <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, it's like it's like a, you're fired. Well, I quit. Uh, that's what that is. I think so too. <laughs> I think so too. Um, how do you feel about slotting them in at the number nine spot? Um, okay, that's okay for now. I, I definitely yeah. think the Halep ban, just because yes. of who Simona Halep is, is is a lot bigger. Yeah, I agree. Can you can you give us some more info on that? Sure. So. Halep, uh, we're talking about four years, and we're talking about a former world number one, a multiple major champion. I don't think tennis has ever seen such a consequential uh, doping ban placed on, on a player of, of that kind of stature, uh, combined with the fact that, and I guess this would come as no surprise, but like she has been, she has been extremely uh aggressive about about her about pleading her innocence when it mm -hmm. comes to the the entire thing and then at at other points lamenting the fact that it took them so long uh to come to a decision but there were multiple aspects of of kind of red flags it it was the regular failed drug test it was also and you know as as more distance between the incident and this um as the distance grows, I start to forget these things, but there is also another version of testing. Do, mm -hmm. do you remember what I'm talking about? It's like Yeah, the, the athlete biological passport. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. That was also came up as irregular. So, yeah. and, and now I guess the latest wrinkle is that Patrick Muradoglu has taken some responsibility for, for recommending the supplements mm -hmm. that apparently were, were tainted enough with this uh you pronounced it beautifully earlier uh <laughs> this substance that is on the banned list yeah the roxa just that that was the kind of what she tested positive for for folks who don't know that's a it's kind of a blood doping um supplement whereby it would increase your oxygen intake and therefore your kind of cardio performance should in theory improve um it's 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 a challenging one because i think there have been so many players and coaches who have come out in defense of Simona's character, particularly previous coaches in Darren Cahill, saying, you know, that she was someone who always double and triple checked, hey, is the supplement safe to take? Can I have this? Can I eat this? And was supposedly someone that was always on top of what, you know, what they were taking. And other players have kind of said, you know, that's not aligned, you know, with who I thought she was and kind of the reputation that she'd built around herself. And um, it's definitely challenging because, you know, the, the, the science is the science at, at one point. It's like you tested for this. It was in your urine. Like, you know, you, you better have a good reason for it. I think the challenging thing in kind of reading that that long report when it was published uh, that she would have the four year ban is that there seemed to be some 
kind of differences in the science between the two teams um, and some debates as to, you know, kind of what would be an acceptable amount that would suggest it was a trace or a contamination in the supplements she was taking versus what would suggest she's actually taking Ruxodistat as a means to improve performance. And I also think it is um, a little challenging that this all took place and happened around a coaching and team change. Uh, she was going through kind of a period of performance that that wasn't great during COVID and um, the results weren't as good as they had been. She'd had a couple injuries. She teamed up with Murata Glue kind of after Serena left the scene and she, you know, was someone in the past that had never been flagged for this type of thing or ever had issues with her testing. So it definitely seems kind of strange that that would happen around the same time and, and definitely unfortunate for the Murata Glue camp. I just don't feel hopeful given kind of the charge that they came down with that she'll have success in appealing this decision. And I think what's super, you know, unfortunate about the situation is also her age and that, you know, a four year ban, I think she's like 33, 34, you know, really kind of puts her at the end of her career. Um, and ultimately, yeah, puts puts a big red stain on everything she's done. I know that Serena Williams also jumped in on the conversation, perhaps suggesting that that was dating back to when they played that Wimbledon final and Simona, I think, only made like three unforced errors or something ridiculous like that. So um, definitely makes one question kind of, you know, her career and what she's achieved. But at the same time, you know, kind of, as I said, it's it it's controversial because folks in her camp and, and those who's been around her seem to think that this can't be true. And it's hard to talk about. It's hard to report yeah. on, which is why like this in terms of importance might have been number one in, in our top 10 controversies and dramas. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not as if this is a, a topic that, you know, tennis Twitter can really uh, have a discussion about with any sort of intelligence. I mean, if, if people want to, you know, be, be rash and irresponsible with, with arguments on both sides. Of course, of course you can find that on the internet, but if you yeah. want to actually have a good conversation about it, it is that it is incredibly difficult because there are two sides that are uh, talking about stuff that the average person doesn't really know about, which is the, the science behind these substances. They are saying completely different things. Uh, there is not a lot of communication when it comes to uh, drug testing in tennis in general and the organizations that are in charge of, of kind of uh, seeking it out. So it, it's tough. And then, you know, the four year ban, the length of it can be debated. And it's kind of like, yeah. look, if somebody is intentionally cheating, is there yeah. an argument to be had that there is no penalty too harsh? Sure. I mean, Liam Brody quote tweeted one of my tweets and said that the ban should be for life. If somebody is caught for doping. I think, mm. you know, the reason I don't agree with that is because I don't trust the drug testing mm -hmm. enough to, to think that it's never going to basically hold players accountable for cheating when really a mistake was made or, you know, something happened irregular with their supplements that, that probably does not warrant a, a lifetime ban. So, uh, yeah, difficult topic, but hugely significant story this year. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that's the other thing to take into account is like, you know, I whenever I think of blood doping, I always think of Lance Armstrong and cycling and, you know, teams were doing that together intentionally. They all knew about it and they continued on, got their sponsorships, had their success. And, you know, if you watch like Lance Armstrong's documentary, he kind of doesn't really feel all that bad about it. Um, whereas with Simona... <laughs> If, if it is true that this happened as a result of a contamination, it's like, you know, four years feels so harsh um, for, for something that might have been an accident. But at the same time, one in terms of proving the intent, I, I even in reading the report, it seems like the intent really isn't the consideration. It's is this substance in your system? And therefore, if it is, here's the ban. Um, which is kind of the tricky uh, I, piece. I would, I would say the report in, in a way actually accused her um, 
of doping intentionally. Like I, it yeah. wasn't the, otherwise we would have seen the Maria Sharapova ban. We would have seen it reduced uh, t to maybe two years. The, the four yeah. year is the max. And it kind of suggests that in, in, in their opinion, based on their investigation, Simona knew exactly what she was doing and did it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Which is harsh. Um, yeah. But, you know, as you say, it's hard to debate because we're not the scientific team. We, we're not we're not looking at the samples and we're not reviewing the what I'm sure is, you know, very long reports coming out of the, the kind of medical team. So where are you leaning towards towards ranking the Halep ban? I put it at three. Oh, OK. I'm down to put it at three. I think it's I was definitely going to say it's a top five moment for me. And I think in terms of stir around the news that that caused, that was a, a top three moment. Which of the remainings do you feel strongly about? Hmm. I'll give you my number two right now. Okay. And uh, that is Shelton's celebration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me why. It, it's a major. It's the end of a major. So already, you know, anything that happens is going to have a uh, heightened debate surrounding it. And this is something that broke through to the mainstream. This was something that your average sports fan, certainly at least in the United States, uh, was <laughs> was interested in, even if they don't care about about tennis. And it was yeah. something that uh, people could debate about and have an opinion about, which, frankly, in tennis is somewhat rare. Uh, we There's a lot of kind of straightforwardness to the way the sport operates, not a lot of uh, good debate topics. But this was something where... You had a bunch of people jumping to to Novak's side, a bunch of people jumping to Ben's side, um, and I'm curious, kind of what what you thought of it before I I give my take. Yeah, I definitely thought that it was a moment that just transcended the the tennis niche and kind of hit the sporting world in general. Which I'm always a fan of those types of moments. The more that tennis can be a part of the larger sports conversation the better in my opinion. I think this was a classic sort of um, old dog versus new dog type of complex and kind of draws on maybe like the two sides of tennis in the sense that there's the, the traditionalists or the purists who, you know, like a certain type of energy and conservatism on the core and a politeness about the game. And then there's, a you know, a section of fans who want more controversy, who want personalities, who love the come ons and the kind of quirky celebrations and the, you know, bold outfit choices and those types of moments for me as a, as a fan are things that get me excited. I am probably leaning more towards that group of type of tennis fan. I think that at times tennis has, gotten in its own way in terms of appealing to a larger audience because they are so yeah traditional and pure and don't want you know the the kind of hoo-ha around the sport which i think at the end of the day makes it kind of hard to have these viral moments that ultimately help the sport reach potentially a new audience or just in general create conversations around the sport that we all love so for me i felt like shelton's celebration a wasn't offensive it sounded like he was copying a friend from college um who had that celebration before so it was a nod to someone he knew i like that it was totally different from what other people do it wasn't you know screaming in your face or something crazy it was a great action in my opinion i don't think tiafo was offended by it i mean that that was a great match and um when i saw Djokovic copying the celebration i looked at it i was like wow like he must have really gotten under your skin for you to do that because Djokovic isn't someone that I think usually cares. And and obviously he won that match also pretty easily. So Ben must have wound him up either in, in the match itself or the pre-match pre -match press conference. And Djokovic kind of wanted to stick one to him. That's how it felt to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think what what's lost in the debate about you know, who has the moral high ground in the, in the whole controversy is that I think both players are just doing what they need to do to play their best tennis. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, and part of that is getting in a certain mindset 
And for Ben, it, it's bringing bravado. It's upping his confidence. Like that's what he's trying to do. For Novak, it's it's letting Ben get under his skin because Novak plays great when something's under his skin. Like I don't think sure. it's hard. I don't think it's hard to to piss off Novak. Um, like <laughs> he lets he lets members of the crowd make him angry. Uh, Cam Nori hit an overhead at him and immediately apologized. Novak got angry, and it, it's not because I don't think it's because. He's just, he can't control it. I think he realizes that if he can let something light a fire in his belly, let it happen. It's going to help me play better. So, like, that's what I think the mindset of Novak is, which, by the mm -hmm. way, like, he's a huge Kobe Bryant guy, Djokovic. Uh, Kobe was a huge Michael Jordan guy. Like, it's in that line of, of thinking yeah. that when somebody offers you a chance to feel disrespected, feel disrespected. Like, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to feel disrespected. Use it as fuel. Yeah, I love that analogy. I think that's exactly it. But perhaps some of the tennis world, or maybe the folks who aren't in the tennis world misinterpreted that as, you know, Djokovic being obnoxious or even Shelton being, you know, arrogant about even doing that celebration in the first place and it rubbed people the wrong way. But I totally agree with you. I think Djokovic looks at this from a selfish opinion as like, I need a little extra energy, a little, you know, motivation to semifinal, the last grand slam of the year. I, you know, I want to make sure I'm in this final and I'm not messing around. I think to me, it just showed that he was super dialed in. And um, as you say, took an opportunity to take that personally. And uh, he did <laughs> played it to his advantage. So, but I would agree with you. It, it definitely, um, you know, kind of caused the social media storm. It was all over the newspapers. And so I would I would also put that in the number two spot as one of the biggest controversies of the year. How do you feel about the Madrid Open? Those kind I of three pieces. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the Madrid Open very high. I have it at number four. Okay. Uh, there was, it was similar to the WTA Finals. It was one thing after another, after another, and the feeling just kind of compounds. It's like, wow, you guys really can't get out of your own way this year, can you? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Cake Gate in particular was <laughs> was unbelievably silly. I mean, I just can't believe we were there. Uh, and like from from a Twitter thing, it's like the opposite of the Simona Halep ban, right? It's really yeah. hard to debate Simona Halep. It's really easy to debate cake size. <laughs> This is true. This is true. So Madrid Open has a special place in my heart because that was that was the first video I made calling them out on uh, the ball kid situation that for me went a little bit viral and, and took me by surprise in terms of how many people were even interested in that conversation. I, I remember making the video being like, nobody is going to give two shits about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, woke up the next day and it had 500,000 views. So I think I think people cared. And I think the way that these kind of three incidents, like as you say, it was one after the other after the other sort of wrapped themselves up, left this kind of sour taste in your mouth of like, what are they doing? And, you know, what is Feliciano Lopez? Like all of his tweets and explanations about things were a further wind up, in my opinion. I mean, he responded to the cake gate controversy and he was like i don't know why everyone is so mad you know the guy's spanish we got him a bigger cake and it's sort of like ah but you know with social media these days and and public appearances and this is a combined tournament with men and women you know maybe it would be within your interest to make it look as similar as possible even if arena wasn't playing a match that day but something that felt more comparable and then rather than kind of tweeting and being like i don't understand what the problem is and kind of compounding the issue and making people more angry it he could have just kind of I, I don't know held his hand up and been like yeah i can see how this doesn't look great like wasn't our intention alcaraz or, is spanish <laughs> or just like let it blow over like sometimes yeah. you're gonna do things that don't go over well and uh it's probably better if you just like let some people on the internet complain about it. And yeah. then like tom <laughs> tomorrow they'll be on to the next thing. But if you are going to kind of resurface it, then that's on you.
Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And I think, I think the issue with the speeches was also something that never really got closed the loop on. And we never really kind of got a satisfying answer as to as to why. I mean, it felt like um, the rumors were that maybe Azarenka might have had something to say, but she's on the WTA players board. I mean, she's very intelligent. I don't think she would have used that as a moment or an opportunity to, you know, really stick one to them. And by not letting them have a victory speech, it's, I just don't understand what logic they had behind that. And then they had no satisfying explanation after the fact. It's just monumentally stupid, uh, (laughs) honestly, because like, these players have millions of social media followers. Yeah. And people don't watch trophy ceremonies of the women's doubles final. Uh, like, not that many people watch it at a major, uh, much yeah. less a Masters 1000. Like, it, it's nothing against it. And it's it's really kind of a doubles thing and a trophy ceremony thing. Like, you just frankly are not going to have that much attention. Now, if Azarenka said something completely wild and it got aggregated yeah. everywhere... Yeah, there's a slight chance that that happens, but there's an 100% chance that if you don't let them say anything, uh, that it's going to get people talking. So it's a a real lack of understanding of the Streisand effect, uh, (laughs) which is when you try to censor, you you end up amplifying the very thing that you are trying to hush. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And and honestly... Based on the, I I would be curious to do a, a search on Twitter and kind of see which, whether the Madrid Open or the Simona Halep ban had more mentions or conversations because it could it could easily sneak into my number three spot as well just with the kind of threefold error, um, but I I like this order I, I like where we're going with it so I can stick with this. <laughs> Should we try to get number eight on the board? Yeah, let's do it. Um, what do you think of the match fixing scandal <laughs> at number eight? Yeah, I could get on board with that. I think the reason why I would put it in the eighth spot is because it is mostly to do with, you know, players that are outside of the top two hundred, even three hundred players that are in the challenger tour. I think to me what made that story particularly interesting was the relationship or deal that the ATP had had with these betting agencies that bring in, you know, a a lot of money to broadcasters and the governing agencies, but the players don't see any of those funds. And I think it's an interesting conversation that Djokovic has brought up recently with the PTPA about there needing to be a mechanism to redistribute the money made from betting to the to the players who are actually being bet on and in other sports we do see mechanisms that allow you know that money to trickle back to to the players and tennis doesn't have a system for that so I thought that was a kind of particularly you know interesting tie I think that it was a huge story and is obviously particularly concerning considering it involved so many players as well. I mean, it was like in the hundreds in terms of how many, you know, people were participating in in this and also how much money he did make. But having said that, it seems like he was caught pretty quickly. It was in, you know, within a couple of years that this whole ring was was brought down and and figured out. And that was a result of, you know, a couple of players giving a tip, which I thought was, you know, interesting in the end. Yeah, which is uh, kind of why I I disagreed with some of the reaction to this story online, mm-hmm. uh, which was that, like, oh look, you see, this is a big problem. It's like, no, the system worked because yeah. they were very they were very very smart about this. There's a way to do it in a way where you're being an idiot and you're going to get caught quickly. And this mm-hmm. was not that. Like they knew yeah. that they had to make small bets. They had to have multiple people in different places making these bets. If the same person is doing it, easy, you're caught. Uh, they knew that you couldn't just have players losing matches, that you had to get a little bit granular with it, have them lose a point here or there, a set here or there. Uh, so, like, they had this they – they, they were doing this in a very, very professional manner, and still they couldn't yeah. get away with it. So, yeah. like, I like to emphasize that it's really – like, people have some – a lot of people have some skepticism about the integrity of the sport 
-hmm. it's really hard to get away with with match fixing. Uh, it's it's near impossible, I think, to get away with match fixing because the systems are in place that are are really really good systems to to catch this stuff. And uh, I mean, if there is a way to do it undetectable, then you'd have a problem. I don't think yeah. that exists. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you, and I think you know between. This and what we've seen with the Yimmer Brooksby ban, the Hallett ban. I mean, there's definitely like mechanisms and and systems in place that aim to stamp out, you know, um, ill behavior in the sport of tennis. And we can see it working at, you know, the challenger level and at the top, very top level. Obviously, they're different things. But, you know, we want tennis to be a clean sport a sport that we know uh, the results are fair. And so I think that this story, I would agree with you, highlighted that the system does work uh, because of how convoluted and intricate of a ring they had to build in order to even have any success. And then at the end of the day, it didn't last that long. So um, the $9 million that he, he made <laughs> doesn't feel all that worth it, to be honest. Yeah, and like it, you're right. If this were tour level, this might be number one or number two, but... Uh, yeah. These weren't even challenger events. These were like 15 Ks, the low, yeah. the lower level ITFs uh, mm -hmm. where, where these were happening. And the reason why they have to happen at that level is because you need players who are super vulnerable and desperate for, for mm. cash. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it, you're not going to get players with careers to lose uh, players who are actually like making 400 K 500 K a year. You're not going to get them uh, to agree with it to, to something yeah. like this, especially because part of the reporting in the, in the Washington post, the payouts for these things were like two, $3,000 Yeah, small <laughs> to the players. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, for me, what makes up my top five, I think I would put the Kato default in the fifth spot. Would you put the ball complaints? I did put the ball complaints. Yeah. Um, Kato. Yeah, it, it was. It, it's a tough call. You want to mm. argue for? You want to argue for Kato? Yeah. So I thought for Kato. First of all, I thought the decision was ridiculous. I mean, uh, I, I know we've seen these types of incidents before, you know, mainly Djokovic being the one that comes to mind of of hitting a ball kid. But he was also on the same side of the net. I mean, this ball came from across the other side of the net. She so clearly was passing it and the ball kid wasn't paying attention. And then you have this sort of argument of like, if she wasn't crying and said she was totally fine, would there have even been a default? And a part of me thinks, no. I also had a very sour taste in my mouth of, yeah, how the opponents, Buskova and Cerebus Tormo, sort of campaigned for it and were caught kind of laughing at what seemed like laughing at the situation. And that felt very unsportsmanlike, in my opinion. And based off of kind of Kato's profile, you know, who she is and the reputation that she has, I... I was surprised that they would kind of so adamantly insist that this was a defaulting type of behavior. I mean, I can think of moments, for example, like I think of Tsitsipas versus Kyrgios last year at Wimbledon. Tsitsipas rifled the ball into the crowd and almost hit someone in the neck. And he did that completely intentionally. He was annoyed and he nothing happened. He didn't get default for that. And to me, there just needs to be some level of you know subjectivity when you apply the rules and looking a little bit at kind of you know did you did you think through this in terms of what was your intent were you doing it out of anger or frustration or were you simply <laughs> hitting the ball to the other end of the court and to me it, like you look at the score and you look at the way she did it and it was like there was no anger or rage about the way that she hit the ball to the other end of the court um, and then I also really, you know, uh, rubbed me the wrong way in terms of her losing the prize money, losing the points. But I mean, I guess that's that's just a part of a default and there's nothing that they can do. Um, but but I just didn't agree with the decision. Yeah, but I think the grossest part about it is the financial aspect of it where. Yeah. Cerebes Tormo um, and um, and Bojkova, like th they don't need. They don't need that 
win nearly as much as Miyu Kato does. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think, you know, it, it's a little bit unsportsmanlike as it is to, to want to win the match based on someone, yes, putting the balls on the other side of the court because they are no longer serving, which mm -hmm. is what that is. And it's something that players do all the time. Yeah. Um, just, you know, you try not to nail a ball kid when you do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but players do it all the time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, that that's the worst part of it to me. It's just, like, don't you understand that, like, this is kind of fun for you and kind of, I think, doubles at, at a major mm -hmm. when singles players are participating. It has somewhat of an exhibition feel in the first couple rounds. Maybe it gets serious a little bit later on. Uh, even if you're a singles player. And, yeah. But for me, okay, to like four majors a year, it, it's time to make money. Like this, yeah. this is when it, this is when it happens. And uh, just that's extremely consequential. And it, 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 that's why it was a, a really, you know, terrible story for, for Kato. It was nice to see the whole tennis world kind of rally around her though. And I'm sure that that yeah. softened the blow for her. Yeah, that's kind of also was some of my thinking around that top five position because there were so many players that came to her defense, singles and doubles players kind of on all levels um, and on the men's side as well. It was nice to see her do well in the in the mixed doubles, even after the fact. Um, I think she won that mixed doubles tournament or did she get to the final? But um, yeah, I mean, she, as you say, I think being a, a doubles player and a doubles specialist, that money and those ranking points matter so much more than, than singles players competing in doubles. And um, I, I just feel really bad for her. I felt like that was an injustice, but um, yeah, it was also right. just yeah. applying to one player, whereas your ball complaints could also go in the number five spot because that kind of applies to everyone. No, th this was a better controversy because uh, also everybody, do you know what I liked about it? Actually, it wasn't a controversy. It was just a drama. Everybody <laughs> was on the same side. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's against, nobody is pro DQ, yeah. uh, pro SST Bushkova. It's like nobody. So uh, I, again, by the way, side note, um, I, I know you've done the break before the, the mm -hmm. web series on Tennis Channel. The Miyu Kato one, I just pulled it up, got 401,000 views. Wow. On YouTube. Wow. That's crazy. That's right? a lot of views for them. <laughs> yeah. So are we aligned? Are we pushing them in the number five spot? Yes. Okay. That leaves us to figure out six and seven. We've got ball complaints and Siegmund versus Goff left. Yeah. So the ball complaints... It, it wasn't like a fun thing, right? I mean, who wants to, it, there's a certain mystery to it also where it's like, all right, Dunlop, Australian Open, like same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no brand change. There was no ball change that we're aware of. Yet you have a bunch of players being like, what are with the balls this year? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, what are with the balls this year? Then of course you don't hear anything, right? You don't yeah. get like an official statement from Tennis Australia or Dunlop explaining what may have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing is apparent, you know, there might be some differences in how players feel about different ball manufacturers or different individual balls. And I think in a lot of cases, players are a little bit biased towards what mm -hmm. suits their play style. Uh, if we're being honest, yeah, what, what everybody can agree on. I think everybody on tour agrees that the changing from different ball, to different ball, to different ball, every single week has a negative effect on their arm health and a negative effect on the quality of tennis. And yeah. that is something that I think everybody wants to solve. And it's just, this is the first year where I think people were like, wait a second, we all agree that this should be better. Let's actually open our mouths about it and talk about it. Mm -hmm. So there is by far the most complaining about that than there ever has been. Yeah. And like my, my solution is that the stenciling on the balls can represent a sponsor um, fine and well so that Wilson or, or Dunlop or Penn can sponsor different tournaments easily, uh, but the actual ball is the same. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't seem to be an issue in, in rackets, right? Like players are going to uh, have a paint job of a Babolat Pure Arrow and right. the spec, the spec, the specific specifications are not exactly Babolat 
pure arrow and it's not the end of the world. We understand that. So why can't you do that with the tennis balls? Yeah, I think that's a really clever suggestion and probably honestly the only one that would really work because unless you can get regions to buy into, you know, uh, for all US Open tournaments or US based tournaments, we use X type of ball, which I just don't think is going to happen. So to me, that seems like the only logical solution, but it certainly needs a solution or an outcome because the the tours have a responsibility to make sure that they protect their players and the longevity and the health of, of the folks who are competing and ultimately selling their product. And if you don't have your best players competing week in, week, week out, because they've got issues with, you know, wrists, elbows and, and shoulders as a result of balls changing every week, then... Um, then the responsibility lies with them and they should really be taking more responsibility to fix it. Um, and right now it just seems like that's sort of like, uh, nothing we can do and leaving it as it is, which feels uh, neglectful to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if somebody actually takes a stand at, at the tours because they would have the power yeah. to do it. Um, yeah. I think the stencil is one solution or, or the super tour. I mean, if there's a super <laughs> tour, then, then we're consolidating all of these sponsorship deals and yes. these media deals, right? <laughs> Bring on the super tour. Yeah, I was actually listening to your um, episode this morning. You talked about that a little bit. And I think I think it is more likely that we'll see a WTA TP merger, but the idea of a super tour is it's certainly intriguing. And, you know, it certainly would fix a lot of issues such as the ball complaints, which... I'll double check you're okay with putting in the sixth spot for us today. Yeah. Six, six okay. is good with me. Yeah. Um, could so how imagine, did you, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, could you imagine going to like the same website, the same app oh. for all four majors? For Wouldn't every that be tournament? nice? Yeah. <laughs> that would be the ultimate fan experience. I mean, I think that's kind of what everybody's yearning for. And um, ultimately what I think, all of these entities and governing bodies should be working towards, um, you know, it, it, however that ends up looking, but the fragmented nature of how the tour is organized at the moment, it's not good for anybody uh, and ultimately leaves a lot of dollars on the table. So why not bring it on? <laughs> um, so last but not least, we'll slot Siegmund versus Goff in that number seven spot. Funnily enough, that did uh, gain a lot of traction on social media during the US Open. Probably because, you know, it was Goff, um, the home favorite. And people love the villain story. So what did you think of the of the incident? I just think it's kind of incredible that <laughs> two US Opens in a row now, the player on opening night in the women's match cried in their press conference. <laughs> Yeah. Like, well, well, okay, I'm a little bit off here. Like, Donka Kovinich, I don't think, cried after playing Serena, but Annette Contivate did in the second yeah, she round. Did, so yeah. it's mm -hmm. like it's two years in a row where the Ash crowd puts someone to tears in the press conference, yeah. which, is, which is amazing. I mean, <laughs> I know some people, you know, some people hate it and resent it and feel, you mm -hmm. know, particularly bad for the athletes. That's totally fair. I think it's, it's okay to have that sympathy for the athlete and also be like, wow, it, it is pretty awesome slash impressive that a tennis environment can be that hostile. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, first of all, Siegmund was being really freaking slow. Um, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I felt like Goff had a, had a point. I mean, she wasn't – the complaints went in the wrong, and also when I think of Goff as a player, she's not really somebody that does kind of – complain to the umpire and kind of try antics or tactics that'll wind up the opponent. I, I definitely felt like she was totally fair to call it out. It, Siegmund was being ridiculously slow. Um, and then also like <laughs> Siegmund's reaction to it just like didn't help her whatsoever by like then stopping and complaining and making it even slower than it than it had been. And I, I just don't think she did much to endear the crowd to herself. And obviously some players you know, I, I, I will never forget Medvedev uh, getting booed at the US Open end this scene. He's like, the more you boo me, the better I play. Please come back next week. Yeah, you know, it was like, it's such an epic moment. And some players, you know, Medvedev, Djokovic, they thrive under that. They love that. And other players, it completely, completely breaks them. And obviously, Siegmund did get the first set off of Goff. So, you know, it was a competitive match. Um, 
and it, she just seemed to crumble under the yeah the noise and energy of that us open crowd and and took it really personally which i i feel a little bad about but at the end of the day it's it's sport and i and i love that type of energy i'm just like yeah, let them have yeah. it if you can't yeah. handle it you can't handle it yeah totally i mean you're gonna have uh sometimes you're gonna have you know home home court advantage it's it's just how yeah. it is and by the way sigmund she she's not a she's not the player who I would be most sympathetic towards. I mean, no. it's not a, not exactly a model of tennis uh, etiquette or sportsmanship. Yeah. I was literally calling a doubles match later on in the tournament. And uh, you know, this was on court 17 and like she, she hit her opponent at the net. Well, okay. There was a, an easy kind of overhead that someone hit at Sigmund's feet, mm -hmm. like literally hit it at her feet. And she like did this angry glare. It was against um, uh, Clergy Ngunway mm. and Robin Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And then like next changeover, Sigmund hits it like, you know, chest, chest, neck area, doesn't yeah. apologize, says, come on. Yeah. And it's like, all right, like, <laughs> you know, you are an antagonist. Like Laura yes. Sigmund is an antagonist. And, you know, I, I can only garner so much sympathy for the antagonist being antagonized yeah yeah it's like you ask for it and um you give that energy sometimes it's going to come back around so i i'm feeling pretty happy about the the list that we have here i i don't think i would make any changes would you no i love it awesome so this is our final list i hope you guys can drop your thoughts and feelings in the comments below and that wraps us up for today. Gil, uh, will you let the people know where to find you and what you have coming in 2024? Sure. Uh, some year-end content coming on the pipeline, Monday Match Analysis Awards, which uh, I got to check this. I think it's the fifth year running. It might be number Amazing. six, but I think it's five. I know. I know. Wow. It's, it's weird how long I've been doing this. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be there soon. You'll be like, this is the fifth <laughs> top 10 rundown of controversies <laughs> at the end of the year. You'll be there before you know it. Um, at Gil underscore gross on Twitter, uh, Gil gross analysis on TikTok, And yeah, that's about it. Amazing. Yeah. Well, we're super excited to watch your categories come out for your awards Monday match analysis. That will be out before the end of the year, I assume. And then, um, yeah, I know you said you'll also be, doing some more commentating and broadcasting uh next year as well so be sure to to post when you're when you'll be doing that so we can all listen to your commentary will do <laughs> an honor to uh to come on here for the first video i mean i i know that this channel is is going to be extremely successful uh you know you bring something fresh and and different to to the sport and the way you cover it and i enjoy it a lot and i i look forward to continue uh to do that Thank you so much. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you guys soon.